Children were accusing their parents of crime satanic rituals that had happened 30 years earlier, and it seemed to be happening all the time. And and I, you played an essential role, in, in, to my recollection, in, in helping save many people's lives as a result. Do you want to talk about that at all? Because I think it's profoundly important. Okay, well... So there's a you, you took a leap a, yeah, ahead of a, uh, a few years. But, yeah. So so we'll go back. Uh, uh, okay. Well, there I was. Uh, I was now. I was studying what happens when you expose people to leading questions and other forms of misinformation. How does that get incorporated into a person's memory and change their memory for the details of an event that actually did happen? Yeah. yeah. They did see a, a a crime scene. They did see a accident. And now we've made them believe that the car went through a yield sign yeah. instead of a stop sign or that the the bad guy had curly hair instead of straight mm-hmm. hair. Changing a detail. Uh, lo- lots of court cases where eyewitness memory was disputed and an issue. Um, many cases where the wrong person was identified as being the perpetrator when uh, when he really wasn't. And along came this really, really strange case. It was around 1990 where, uh, in fact, I remember getting the call from the defense attorney. He said, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm representing a guy accused of murder. And the only evidence against him is the claim of his daughter, Eileen. Defendant's name mm-hmm. was George Franklin. So Eileen was accusing her father, saying that, she was like in her late 20s, that 20 years mm. earlier, she'd seen her father kill her little eight-year-old best friend, uh, and she repressed her memory into the unconscious, and now through some process, the memory was back. She said she repressed her memory of, you know, even other murders. She repressed her memory of continual rapes by <sighs> the father and sexual assaults by other people. So uh, the attorney who said... Who, who was a very experienced San Francisco attorney, said, w- w- what do you know about this idea of repression? I said, well, you know, it's kind of this hand-me-down Freudian idea that we banish all yeah. this excessive trauma into the unconscious. It's walled yeah. off. We have no access to it. Um, but then we can go into therapy or something and become aware of it and reliably recover it all. But when I started to look for the evidence, it was amazing. There was no credible <laughs> scientific support for this idea. And and I explained that to this attorney, but uh, this daughter was so convincing, mm-hmm. and she had the support of a psychiatrist who basically blessed her memory and said, that's how it works, yeah. and this mm-hmm. is you can count on it in so many words. And George Franklin was convicted. So yeah. h- here you have the first... American citizen virtually convicted based on a claim of repressed and recovered memory. But what would be happening here if this memory weren't real? And I certainly suspected that it wasn't and that her memory had all these details could be found in the Mm -hmm. public domain from this high -hmm. high publicity case. Where could that come from? How could such a, a rich, deep, complete thing be created in her mind, assuming she wasn't deliberately lying, Mm -hmm. if it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. I wanted to study that. And so that's what led me into a whole kind of new line of work where we're going to plant a seed of memory and watch it grow into something big.